So like, why not consider them? Then you get intersectionality. This is one of the things that's really comical, I think, because the postmodernist identity politics types actually realized this. They thought, well, okay, race and gender. Fair enough. Well, what, if you're, what if you're a black woman? Well, that's a problem because, well, now you've got two dimensions of differentiation. What the hell are we going to do about that? And what, if you're, what if you're gay and black and female? Well, then what if you're not very bright and gay and black and female? And then what if you're ugly and not very bright and gay and black and female? And like, you can keep playing that game. You can keep playing that game an infinite number of ways, because there's an infinite number of ways to categorize things, as the postmodernists already pointed out. And so the intersectionality theorists came along to plug the hole, but they don't know where they're going. They don't understand that the logical conclusion of intersectionality is individuality. Because there's so many different ways of categorizing people's advantages and disadvantages that if you take that all the way out to the end, you say, well, the individual is the ultimate minority. And that's exactly right, and that's exactly what the West discovered. And, you know, the intersectionalists will get there if they don't kill everyone first. <laughs> so, on to white privilege. So, it's really interesting to find out where these ideas come from. Because usually the scholarship is so awful, you just cannot possibly believe it. It's just absolutely... It wouldn't... In, at the University of Toronto, in the psychology department, the original paper on white privilege wouldn't have received a passing grade for the hypothesis part of a undergraduate honors thesis. We're not even close. There's no methodology at all. The person who wrote it, it was called White Privilege and Male Privilege. A personal account of coming to see correspondences through work in women's studies. Well, first of all, personal account. It's like, sorry, no. Um, <laughs> So she, she listed a bunch of ways that she thought, she says, these are personal, personal examples of her unearned privilege, or unearned privilege that she saw as she experienced in the 1970s, 1980s. So this, by the way, the, so this idea is the opinion of one person who wrote one paper that has absolutely no empirical backing whatsoever, which is a set of hypotheses, which had never been subject to any statistical analysis. Like, if I ask you a bunch of questions, it's not obvious how many questions I'm asking you, because I could say, how tall are you? Or I could say, if you're laying on the ground, how extended would you be? It's like, that two questions? It's like, no, it's one question. It's just asked two ways. And the way you figure out if you ask someone a bunch of questions, how many questions you're asking them is by doing something called a factor analysis, which is kind of an elementary form now of social science investigation. If you make a questionnaire, you have to subject it to a factor analysis because you've got to find out how many questions you're asking. Because you might think it's 60, but it's probably not. It's probably five. That's the big five, by the way. Anyways, who cares about that? There's no such thing as methodology anyways. That's all part of the oppressive white male European patriarchy. So we can just not bother with that, and we can pen a few notes about how we think the world is constructed, and then we can screw up the entire political system two decades later. Okay, so here's her white privilege list, some of it. There's like 50 things. I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. If I should need to move, I can be pretty sure of renting or purchasing housing in an area which I can afford and in which I would want to live. That's actually a wealth thing, by the way. I can be pretty sure that my neighbors in such a location will be neutral or pleasant to me. I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. I can turn on my television or open to the front page of the paper and see people of my race widely represented. When I'm told about our national heritage or about civilization, I am shown that people of my color made it what it is. Well, there's 50 of those, I think, something like that. Okay. Is that white privilege or is that like majority privilege? Is the same true? You go to China, you're Chinese. Is the same true if you're Chinese? Is it majority privilege? And if it's majority privilege, is like, isn't that just part of living within your culture? So let's say you live in your culture, you're privileged as a member of that culture. Well, obviously, that's what the culture is for. That's what it's for. Why would you bother building the damn thing if it didn't accrue benefits to you? Now, you might say, well, one of the consequences is that it accrues fewer benefits to those who aren't in the culture. Yeah, but you can't immediately associate that with race. You can't just do that, say it's white privilege. There's many things it could be. 
It certainly could be wealth. And the intersectional people have already figured out that there's many things it could be. So, like, what the hell? Seriously. Well, what's going on? Well, we let these pseudo-disciplines into the university because we're stupid and guilty. <laughs> Seriously. And they have no methodological requirements, and plenty of power, and plenty of time to produce nonsensical research, and produce, like, resentful activists, and now we're bearing the fruits of that. 